Okay, so we're going to continue after Pesach. We have a little bit of a break. We're holding Perek Lamed Zayin, chapter 37 in the Tanya. It's a quite a long chapter, so we'll divide it into two parts tonight and next week. Just a brief introduction. As many of you probably have noticed, the world is going crazy. And perhaps I'll give a separate lecture about that, what exactly is going on. But Kabbalistically, we do have a tradition that towards the end of days, the Kohota Tum'ah, the forces of impurity, will go wild. They will intensify because they will realize that their end is approaching. And one way of realizing this is because their source of nourishment, the Kedusha, the holiness, is going to become powerful. In other words, when the Kedusha becomes powerful, their power is diminished. How is it diminished if they themselves nourish from the Kedusha? The reason for that is because when the Kedusha takes over, when it overtakes the Tumah, when it dominates the scene, then even that which is Tameh has the ability to rise, has the ability to become included into the Kedusha. And therefore, the real Tum'ah ceases to exist. When I say real Tum'ah, is because as the Tanya has explained to us, and he elaborates a little bit on, on this in this chapter, there's the Klipat Noga, which has some good and some bad, and there's the three Klipot of Tum'ah that are completely bad. You can call it evil. The good in the bad, the good that is mixed in the bad, that is somewhat useful, becomes elevated. That is the goal of Am Yisrael, that is part of our mission, is to elevate the physical world to a, a more higher or more elevated spiritual state, to be metaken, to correct, to purify this world, to make this an abode for Hashem to bring his light down here. And that which is good, that is trapped in bad, will become elevated as well. Whereas that which is completely bad will cease to exist because it will no longer have from what to nourish. It will realize that its death is near. It's like you're strangulating it. And it's not so much that Kedusha is being intensified. It's, it's, a, it's more of a result of the light of Hashem appearing on the scene. The light of Hashem represents the truth. And when the truth becomes apparent, that which is falsehood dies or begins to disappear. The two cannot coexist. So today we have a greater amount of sheker a greater amount of falsehood than ever before because these are the, the last days of the Sheker, these are the last days of the Tum'ah and it begins to make great efforts to try to avoid its fall, its downfall and that is why you are seeing many many things that are very very strange going on the, there's a continuous battle between good and bad between right and wrong. It's always been around, but towards the end, that battle will take on a whole different dimension, where it will become obvious that which is true from that which is false. One will be able to discern a little bit better towards the very end, which one is which. As I've explained in different lectures, there will be a filtering process where the two will, will not be able to live or to coexist anymore together. So as this battle begins, and as the light of Hashem becomes more and more intense, or more revealed, I should say, then all that is Tum'ah and all that is contrary to Hashem's plan begins to falter, begins to fail. And when that begins to happen, there's a shake-up in the world order. And that is partially what the world is experiencing today. And subconsciously, of course, they don't even realize that that's what is going on. Even though on the surface, 
it is becoming apparent in different ways. But Kabbalistically, this is what is going on. We're talking about the forces of evil, sensing that their day is coming, that their end is coming, and they are struggling, trying to stop that. Anything that has life, if it feels, it senses that it is about to leave, it tries to hold on, it tries to catch on, it tries to grab whatever vitality it has to survive. That is just the nature of, of, of everything that is in existence. There's a, a desire to survive, there's a desire to, to be around. That's the way Hashem made it. And when it senses that its time is coming, it resists. It doesn't want to leave. It wants to continue to, to be around. But the end will be, of course, that Hashem will reign. Hashem will be one. There will be clarity to all. That will be at the very, very end. In order to understand this chapter, I'd like to quote the Midrash that says that if the non-Jewish world would only know how much benefit they could have derived from the Bet HaMikdash, from the Temple, not only would they never have destroyed it, they would have protected it 24 hours, 7 days a week. They'd have put guards to surround it, to not let anyone damage it. Apparently, you know, obviously, a lot of people did not understand the value of the temple, even the Jewish people. How did they, they allow something like that to be destroyed two times? A lot of people don't understand the value of certain things in life until it's too late. Later on they regret it, the mistakes that they've made. The Bet HaMikdash, the temple, the holiness that was there, was not something that was just local locally felt. It was something that generated tremendous blessing and good for the entire world, even though it was in one particular location, even though it just occupied a certain amount of acres, I guess you could say. It spread all over the world. In other words, its existence, the House of Hashem, was of tremendous importance and benefit for the entire world. Not just the Jewish people, for the entire world. And that is the meaning of, of, why Hashem, of why Hashem wanted to give the Jewish people so many mitzvot. As it says, Hashem wanted to give the Jewish people many merits. That's a simple interpretation. Therefore, He gave them many commandments. You give them many commandments, you're giving them the opportunity to do a lot of good, to increase their reward, to accomplish something in this world. But it's not just merits, because zakot also means to purify, zikuch. God wanted to purify the Jewish people. He wanted to elevate their soul. With zakot, it decided, fichach, therefore he gave them Torah and mitzvot, that these mitzvot should guide them into elevating themselves to a higher state. In other words, through the instructions of the Torah, through observance of the mitzvot, they will be able to accomplish something tremendously for their own neshama. So it's not only for the world, we're also talking about for the individual. As we will see in this chapter, when one performs good deeds, he's accomplishing a lot, not just for himself, but also for the world. In other words, every action has either positive or negative consequences, depending if that action is a mitzvah, a say, a positive commandment, or a mitzvah lotase, a negative commandment. So by not doing something that is negative, that strengthens our position. It strengthens the Jewish people, it strengthens the individual if he resists, holds himself back from doing that which is wrong. So we have both. We have the positive commandments and the negative commandments. The combination of the two brings about tremendous merit to the Jewish people, a tremendous blessing to the world, as we will see. The world is somewhat aware of the contamination that exists today, whether it's light pollution 
or whether it's the heat that is what they call global warming or whether it's the simple pollution coming out from factories and cars and affecting the ozone. As you know, the world is quite familiar with this type of pollution and contamination and these are facts. They actually do tremendous harm to the environment, no doubt about it. What the world does not understand, does not even know, is that there's another form of contamination, a spiritual contamination, that we have been calling Tum'ah, impurity. We've been talking about impure forces a lot, but it's very difficult to show people what these forces are all about. All we can do is look at the damage that has happened to humanity throughout the history, the killings, the atrocities, the destruction, that is all coming from the tzad, from the side of Tuma, of impurity. Kedusha builds, holiness builds, wants to build this world, wants to make this world a better world, to elevate the world, to make it an abode for Hashem, to reside here, and Tuma wants to destroy. So the impure forces are destructive in various ways. So here we're talking about a state of impurity, which is contaminating the world, contaminating the, the minds of many people. And therefore, people think the way they do as a result of what they absorb. The human mind is uh, unfortunately very weak, that it could be easily influenced for the bad. To become bad, to be influenced to do the the wrong thing is easier than to be influenced to do that which is right and good. The bad or that which is evil, that which is impure, is much more powerful by default than that which is good. So one is easily misled by the environment where he lives, by people, because the human being is susceptible to what he sees, to what he experiences, unless, of course, he has a clear mind of his own. And that kind of clarity cannot come to one unless he's very, very strong or he learns Torah. One who learns Torah is still susceptible. People can become corrupted no matter what they learn. But at least he has a better chance of reminding himself that he may not be following the right path. So, living in a world that is very, very much contaminated, like in our times, presents a tremendous danger, a tremendous challenge to people who want to be good, who want to do the right thing. So therefore, the Tanya, and there are other books as well, are even more important than ever in reminding us what the mission of the Jew, of the non-Jew is, what the challenges are, who the real enemy is, and what exactly can we do to maintain our sanity and not go crazy. And unfortunately, this is what's going on today. A lot of people are losing their spiritual sanity and not realizing this, that they have no longer control over their destiny, over their life. They're being carried away by a certain trend that is unfortunately uh, taking with it many innocent souls. There are many, many people who are truly innocent, innocent meaning that they are not bad, they don't have bad intentions, but they're being swept by this trend of impurity that is overtaking the world and causing tremendous, tremendous spiritual damage, more and more spiritual damage than ever. So the world on the one hand is aware of certain contaminations, they even know what a nuclear bomb can do to contaminate the world, but they don't pay attention to how all the pornography and all the corruption and all the other forms of impurity are causing even more damage to humanity than any bomb can ever do. Because that which is physically destroyed can be easily rebuilt. It may take time, it may take money, 
But that which is spiritually destroyed, there may not be a chance. People's lives are ruined, whether it's their marriage or whether it's uh, some other relationship. And it may just be too late for them to m make amends and to try to repair that which was destroyed by following the wrong philosophy, the wrong teachings, and by not stopping to think about what is really important in life. I've spoken a little bit about it in the past, how sometimes time does what it does in helping people overcome their uh, distorted beliefs. Because with time, people mature, people become more knowledgeable, and they realize their mistakes. That in the past they were rebellious, that they uh, emphasized the wrong th ideals in life, and now they've matured and settled. So it's true that sometimes people will hopefully catch themselves. But why make, this, why make the mistakes to begin with if you can avoid them by learning about it early on? So that's the importance of learning. And I always emphasize this because no matter what one's religion or faith is, regardless, if one is knowledgeable and understands the value of learning early on, he will be greatly helped. Because if the head is empty of any learning, then what will overtake it will be a, an emphasis on materialism, which I've already spoken about separately in another lecture. Materialism being something that is very, very prominent in this generation. The physical world being something that is very, very attractive. It has tremendous power. And lure, it lures people you know, to want to uh, invest in it. And spirituality is lacking. So, obviously, those who learn hopefully you learn the right things early on, will definitely have an advantage over those who don't learn. In the previous chapter, the discussion was about the will of Hashem to have an abode in this world. Even though there's less concealment of Hashem in the upper worlds, Dafka, Hashem wanted to have an abode in this world of darkness. Darkness meaning where He is very, very much concealed. As we pointed out, because the light that comes out of the darkness is a more intense light. It stands out even more than in those worlds where there is already some light and less darkness. Take a candle in the afternoon. What will it do for you? A candle in the afternoon? Candle at night. So there's great darkness in this physical lower world. And that is where Hashem wanted to have His abode to have His light be revealed through, of course, our deeds and through our recognition of Him. However, in the end of days, as we call it the Messianic era, which is when we will have the Tachlit Abriya, that is when the purpose of creation will become more evident, when the Giluya Shechina when the revelation of Shekhinah will be apparent to all. At that point, even the nations of the world, the non-Jews, will experience Gilu Shekhinah. This Takhlit, this ultimate revelation of Hashem, which will eventually happen when Mashiach arrives, is helped or comes about through our massing through our deeds. In other words, not only can we speed it up, the way this happens, the way this comes about, is through the Jewish people observing the mitzvot. As opposed to Matan Torah. When Hashem gave the Torah in the very beginning, that was on His own initiative. He appeared. He spoke to us without us having to almost do anything. The Tachlita Briya, the end of days, which represents the final or ultimate goal of creation, 
comes about or needs to happen through ma'asim, through deeds. This is why the galut has been so long. This last diaspora in exile has taken so long. Because Hashem says, I want you to bring Mashiach. Mashiach can do everything right now. It serves no purpose. He wants human beings to bring him. He wants especially the Jewish people to do what it takes to make that revelation very, very strong. In other words, so the Tachlita Briya in the end involves, needs to involve actions of human beings, especially the Jewish people. So he explains like this, the reason for that is because HaGorem Shara Mitzvah Hu HaMitzvah Atzma What brings about the reward for the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. What does that mean? So the Lubavitcher Rebbe has a nice explanation for this. He says, imagine a worker who's employed to plant a field and he's paid for his job. That worker did not make the money. That money that he's given is just compensation for it, but he didn't make the money. He made whatever he, he made in the field. The money is a compensation for his work. Whereas by us, when we do a mitzvah, that mitzvah creates the sachar. It creates the reward. That's the difference. And the reason that is so is because the mitzvah draws the light of Hashem into this world from above down to below. So people forget that the mitzvah is not just something that is correct, that is proper, or that we get rewarded for it. It's not just that. It's an actual benefit. It actually does something. It produces something in this world. When we say, when we talk about the light coming down into the world, or as we will soon see, onto the individual himself, we're talking about a transformation, a real transformation. It, it's going to make a big difference. Any mitzvah that a person does, does something to him. And the more he does it, the better. So besides the reward, we're talking about drawing this light that Hashem says, I want you to bring it down into this world. And imagine if all the Jewish people would observe all the mitzvot, you know what this would do to the world. And he talks about it towards the middle of the chapter. What a different kind of world it would be just because of us. No wonder the rabbis tell us what, when there's trouble in the world, it's the Jews' fault. <laughs> and here we are saying they're always blaming us for everything. But they are right. They don't know why. But in some ways we are to blame for other people's troubles because obviously there's something not right that we are doing. Otherwise, why would this happen? Why would there be this trouble? We are in some ways responsible. People wonder why the Jews are suffering so much more than anybody else. Why is there anti-Semitism? Well, the great responsibility that has been given to us. So much depends on us. So he continues on that through the observance of mitzvot, we bring a tremendous light, the Or and Sof, the light of Hashem into this world. And this light dresses itself up in the physicality of this world. This world is physical. And when we're talking about a physical world, we're talking about a, a world that appears to be devoid of anything that is spiritual. But the more light of Hashem that is drawn into this world, the physical world becomes elevated. In other words, it is possible, as we will see, to elevate even that which is physical to become more and more spiritual. Because what is happening here is we're taking something that was originally under the dominion of Klipat Noga. Think of government. A government is dominion, right? We're taking something that is under the dominion or rulership of, of that shell called Klipat Noga, from where it receives its nourishment, its vitality, in elevating it, giving it a, a more spiritual vitality of sorts. How? So he gives some examples. He says, 
think of all those things that are permissible for us, all those things that are pure for the Jewish people, that the Torah considers pure. They are physical, but we observe a mitzvah with them. Take parchment, right? And you make tefillin, you write tefillin on them. Mezuzah in Sefer Torah. So he says you have taken something which belongs to the physical world, right? But you've elevated its status by performing a mitzvah with it. And he says, like the rabbis tell us, Lo kshar shamayim, ela mutarim beficha. That which is used for melechet shamayim should be that which is pure and permissible for you to eat. Another example is using an etrog that is not from Orla. Orla, as you know, is the first three years that a fruit grows on a tree. We cannot eat the Orla, we cannot eat those fruit. And he explains in a side comment that Orla, that prohibition of Orla, is from the three klipot at meot legamre. There's three shells that are completely unclean. When we say something is completely unclean, it means, as the Chaim explains, that they can never have an aliyah, they can never be elevated. Something which is completely tamer by nature has to eventually be destroyed, removed. It's not that you can correct it or elevate it. It's a complete opposite of the Kedusha. You have Kalipat Noga, which you can elevate. It's a mixture of good and bad. But that which is completely tame is, is not useful. On the contrary, it's, it's uh, damaging. It, c it can be very damaging to one. So we are not allowed to eat orla. Even though we're observing a mitzvah. No, you cannot observe a mitzvah by, by doing an avirah. So here we're taking something that is not a problem. It's not an etrog of orla or any other mitzvah. We have to be careful that it should not be a mitzvah haba that is performed by committing some sort of sin. Imagine somebody wants to build a sukkah, but he, he steals the, the two by fours, <laughs> right? So he's performing a mitzvah, building the sukkah through an abena. That is no, no. Or using ma'och, using money for tzedakah that is not from gezel, that stolen money. He wants to give tzedakah, but he wants to be Robin Hood. <laughs> you know, to take from the rich and give to the poor. No, you can't do that. So, in observing the mitzvot, we want to make sure that it's completely permissible what we're doing. Otherwise, the mitzvah is not a, a real mitzvah. So, all these mitzvot that are actions that involve certain physical actions actually elevate that physical object from that which it was before completely and only physical to a higher state because he explains their vitality was previously from klipat noga now that it elevates it becomes completely nullified in the divine light it becomes one because the mitzvah is the son of hashem so it becomes one and united with the with this light. The, the Ratzon Hashem is dressed up in the mitzvot. And wherever there is gilui or, wherever, as we said before, wherever there's a revelation of Hashem's light, there's complete nullification, it becomes one. So that's what happens when we elevate even a physical object, even a physical object it becomes nullified in the light of Hashem. And it was by observing a mitzvah, which is the will of Hashem, it becomes nullified or one with Hashem. He goes on to say, and in the same way that objects, physical objects, that one performs a mitzvah with them, can become elevated, same thing with the nefesh abeyemit, same thing with the animal soul, in the various limbs and organs, that observe the mitzvah, they become also dressed up by the observance, by the performance of the mitzvah, and they are able to elevate themselves 
from the klipa, from the impure shell, to be included in the kedusha, in the holiness of the mitzvah, which is his will. In other words, the mitzvah is his will represented through the observance of a mitzvah. And as a result of observing these mitzvot, the nefesh abehemi, the animal spirit, also becomes in some ways elevated and united with the light, with the divine light. Then he says, well, what about that which is not exactly a physical act? The learning of Torah, Kriyat Shema, prayer, these are all important, but these are mitzvot that we do by uttering words, by speaking, not by physically acting on something. It says, even they, although we just verbalized something, even though they're not a physical action per se, under the dominion of Klipat Noga, nonetheless, he says, we hold that a thought alone is not like speech. In other words, we know that there's a big difference between thoughts and speech. Whereas speech constitutes something a lot more than a thought. And therefore, certain mitzvot you cannot observe or fulfill just by thinking about them. If they require to be, if something is required to be said, you need to say it. The thought alone will not suffice. And he goes on to say that even akimat sefatav, as the rabbis tell us, even by just articulating, by moving our lips in a, in a, in what, in, in a slight way, is called a maaseh. It's called a deed. It's called an action. So therefore, that which is said with our mouth also is considered a form of maaseh, a form of action. Because in the end, think about it, he says, the nefesh eloki, the divine spirit, cannot really act in this world without an intermediary. It needs to use lips, the mouth, the tongue, the teeth, the which are physical. And it can only use them by way of the nefesh abehemi, the animal soul. The nefesh eloki cannot do anything that's physical. It needs a physical body. It needs that which is physical. So this nefesh abehemi is dressed up in the organs of the body. And therefore it's the intermediary. So they are considered, you know, as the speech, as though a physical action was performed. Because that's the only way the nefesh eloki can act. is through them, through the nefesh abehemi dressed up in the various organs and limbs of the body. He adds that the more intense the speech is, the more koach, the more energy that one puts in. He puts in more koach into the nefesh ahiyunit with these words. In other words, obviously, the more emphasis, the more focus, the more concentration, the more energy that is applied, the more powerful it is. It makes a, it makes a big difference. And this is the meaning of the pasuk, kol atzmotai tomarna. As the pasuk says, all my bones say or declare this. In other words, our, our body should feel it, should express it. In other words, it should be intense. Where the, where the whole body feels it, not just lip service. So, obviously, the more koach, or the more energy one puts in, the, the more of a difference it will make in bringing in more koach of the nefesh ayloki into the nefesh achiyuni. In other words, the, the light of Hashem would definitely penetrate a lot more if it was more intense, if a person is more devout, if a person has more kavana, more energy is applied. There's no, there's no doubt about it. This makes a big difference in the observance of a mitzvah or in the prayer that is more intense. 
he goes on to say that this is the meaning of what the rabbis meant in Marucham, Bechol Ramach Evarim, Mishtameret, Vimlam Enam Mishtameret. If the Torah is Arucha, in other words, it is arranged, it is properly, uh, I guess, absorbed in all the 248 limbs, then it will be Mishtameret, it will be protected, it will be kept, it will stay in its place. If not, Enam Mishtameret, it will not stay in its place, it will be forgotten. In other words, if an individual verbalizes his learning, for example, he doesn't read quietly, and he does so repeatedly, all the time, reviews his learning, this learning eventually becomes arucha, it becomes very well established, and takes root in him, and he's able to, to memorize it and to know it well. So if the mitzvot are very well established in one's body, they will be preserved there, they will stay there. If they're not, if they're loose, the person does not take them seriously, or does not repeat them, or does not say them clearly, then enna mishtamirat. As he explains, because what happens is something called forgetfulness. And this forgetfulness, shikha, is from also from the klipa of the goof and the nefesh abeyamit. It's also from the shell of the body and of the animal spirit. Forgetfulness, which is from klipat noga, that sometimes can be included in the kedusha. How could it be in included in the kedusha? If he's metish kohan, if he weakens their power and brings in the power of the energy of the Kedusha, the Kedusha of Torah or Tefillah, then by, by, by uh, instilling the power of Kedusha through Torah and Tefillah, he is able to do away with the Shekha, he is able to do away with the forgetfulness. So forgetfulness, which comes from the Klippa, is a symptom of where something is not completely Arucha, not completely preserved in his body. And that is why he forgets. We're not talking about dementia here. We're not talking about someone who forgets for reasons of uh, illness and so forth. We're talking about that he doesn't review it. He doesn't pay attention. He doesn't take it seriously. So therefore, when he does put in more of the holy energy, of the holy the Koach of Dusha of Torah, that hopefully will eliminate the shikha, the forgetfulness. In addition to this, he says, the Koach, the energy of the nefesh, achiyunit, nefesh of vitality, dresses itself up in the letters of Torah, of Talmud Torah, or prayer, or it's what I say, some positive commandment, and as a result of that, that energy, or that which, which uh, comes out from it, that vitality that is brought, up, brought out over here, all of this comes from where? All of this comes from the dam, from the blood of Klipat Noga. What this means is that all the food and drink that the individual had has become blood. And as a result of that, all that vitality and all that energy that he's investing in observing a particular mitzvah or in learning Torah is, is an outgrowth, you can call it, or it's, it is made possible as a result of all that he's eaten and, dra and drank. And therefore, that vitality, or that koach, that energy, is also something that is going to be elevated. Because this is what contributed towards it. So all of this vitality that at one time was under the dominion of the Klipat Noga is now being elevated. It is being transformed from Ra to Tov, from bad to good, and being included in the Kedusha. 
how is that happening? Through the, through the vitality that, it is, that is being received now, that is coming from the Torah, from the letters of the Torah, or from the observance of the mitzvot that are dressing itself up in it. So you're taking food and drink that was observed or was somehow involved in a mitzvah in transforming it from a physical type of energy to a more spiritual type of energy and elevating it. As we've said before, it is possible to take that which is physical and make it more spiritual. People think of, it, of food and drink as something that affects their physical body. But it's not just the physical body. It really can affect the neshama as well. Because when one eats just for the sake of eating, right, it's not really doing anything for his neshama. On the contrary, he's giving more strength and energy to the physicality in him. Whereas when one drinks Kiddush, it's the Chala, made a Beracha on it, of course. It is a whole different kind of an experience. Even though it's still food, but the type of food that is now in his system has become elevated. And therefore, that which has nourished before from the Klipat Noga is being transformed from Ra Letov and being included in the Kedusha. Through that newfound energy that is being dressed up with the letters of the Torah or through the observance of some mitzvot which, as he explained, this is the inner aspect of his will. And this vitality eventually is also included and becomes one with the light, with the divine light. And, he says, this vitality itself eventually is included in the light of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And, at a later stage, what will happen is the entire Klipat Noga will be elevated as well, which is the vitality of this entire physical world. And this is a, this is a very fascinating point, that at some point the goal is to transform the entire physical world into a more elevated state, a more spiritual state. And the question will, is, how will this be done, and when will this happen? And that's where the second part of the chapter goes through, but we will just cover a little bit of it. How can we possibly transform the entire vitality of this physical world? In other words, to take that which is bad and elevate it to that which is good. So we're no longer talking about just the nefesh of the individual here, and we're no longer talking about one particular object. Now we're talking about the, the, the entire klipat noka, the entire vitality of Olam Hazen, of the physical world. So when will all this be? So he says like this, when all the neshamot, all the souls, the divine souls, amongst the Jewish people that are subdivided, or I should say that are, I guess, yeah, you can call it subdivided, into 600,000. Because in reality you have a lot more Jewish people than 600,000. But as we will later on see next week, the 600,000 represent the parent soul from which there are additional sparks. So you have 600,000 parent souls, main souls. So when all these souls observe the mitzvot, when we're talking about observe the mitzvah, we're talking about the 248 positive and the 365 negative. What's the idea of the 365 negative? To prevent the blood vessels, or the sinews in, in our body from being nourished by the wrong forces. As we said before, when one holds himself back from committing a sin, he's not letting his body, certain parts of his body, to become affected by a potential threat. So here we have 
248 positive mitzvot that need to be observed, that will do something for us, something positive. And now we see that this will do something for the world. Plus, holding ourselves back in not, God forbid, committing a transgression involving any one of the 365 in order to deprive or to not allow the impure impurities or impure forces to affect us. In other words, in order that they, those, the blood vessels, the sinews, should not derive any nourishment from the three complete impure shells. So, again, when all the neshamot, which is something very difficult, to get everybody to do the right thing, to observe the 248, to be careful with all the 365, <coughs> which, by the way, the, when we say 365, we're talking about the 365 negative commandments and their additional rabbinic branches, because if any of those transgressions are committed, since they come from the, since they come from the three unclean shells, these are temeot completely. These are completely unclean, which means it's very difficult if one commits them to elevate them to Hashem, since those they're completely bad. If they got if they got contaminated by one of them. Because the only way, as we said before, they can be defeated is by completely eliminating them. Even though he doesn't get into it over here, teshuvah is obviously a way of getting rid of something. Proper teshuvah. But it's not necessarily so easy. An action needs to be done to correct a wrong. It's not just something that you can just fix easily. And that's what he, that's what he, he says, that these klipot me'ot, is something that can be very harmful for the neshama and to the world because we cannot elevate it. We can, these, they will always be around the klipot at not until Mashiach comes. So the Jew is therefore entrusted to be careful and to avoid any of these 365 because of the harm it does to themselves and if they are themselves harmed then they cannot complete their mission. When will they be removed? As the Pasuk says, Ruach HaTumah Avir Minaretz, when Hashem removes them completely. Whereas the, the mission or the goal of the 248 positive commandments is to draw the light of Ensof of Hashem down to this world and to elevate and to, and to bond and to unite <coughs> with Him the, the animal spirit that we have. So this is something that is done continuously by observing the mitzvot, a Jew is able to transform or to bond the 248 organs or limbs in his physical body, be Yehud Gamur, completely united with Hashem, which is exactly what Hashem wanted. When we say that He wanted an abode in this world, this can happen when the Jewish people would observe the mitzvot. Because what would happen then is if they all would, then our, our bodies, in a sense, will become like a merkava, like the avot. It will become like a chariot, like our forefathers, continuously doing the will of Hashem almost automatically. If that would happen, that we would become a merkava, then the entire physical vitality of this world, which is currently klipat noga, would also be able to come out of its tumah and its chela. The difference between Tumah and Chela, Tumah is impurity, which means that which is evil, and Chela is that which is Klipat Noga, in other words, it's something good, but he calls it Chela, it's not completely pure in the way it is, it's, it's trapped. So look what would happen if the Jewish people would observe the 248 positive commandments, avoid the 365, which is the ultimate goal in allowing the Shekhinah to be here, where the light will be revealed, which in turn would make us a mekava, which in turn will take the vitality of this world and elevate it and remove it from the kripat noga, from the tumah, 
and elevated to the Kedusha to be a Merkaval Hashem, Bitgalut Kevodo, when his glory will <coughs> eventually be revealed. In other words, in the end, as he started saying in the beginning of the chapter, this is what Hashem wants to do. This is the Taklit Abriya, that we should bring this about through our Maasim. And when that happens, the entire world will see the glory of Hashem. The Malek of Hashem Kolaretz and His glory will be filled all over the world. And the Jewish people will see Ein Be'ain, will clearly see this light and experience it in the way they experience it in Matan Torah, when they receive the Torah. So in the end, this is the Takhlit. This is what Hashem wants to bring about, but it has to happen through our Maasim. And this is how we make it happen. And when it does happen, when we do achieve it, when Mashiach comes, it will become evident. The light will be so strong that no one will have any doubts about it. Everybody will want to seek the knowledge of Hashem and forget about everything else. People will realize what's truly important. And that is a very simple result of not having all that Tum'ah bothering us and competing with it. You know, it's automatic. It's, it, it, it happens pretty much automatic when you remove the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. When the light of Hashem becomes so strong and apparent, nobody cares about the Tum'ah anymore. It is no longer as tempting. So, the whole world will experience it. And Am Yisrael will see it on the same level that they saw in Matan Torah, where it says, You've been demonstrated, you have seen for yourself that Hashem is the only God. There's no one but Him. When that happens, then three klipot, the unclean klipot, unclean shells will be... <coughs> those three shells will cease to exist. Because now, the yinika, the nourishment from, from the Kiddushah comes about through Klipat Noga, which acts as an intermediary. They need to nourish from the Kiddushah, otherwise they would cease to exist. But the problem is, for them, that that Klipat Noga will become transformed and elevated. So they won't have any intermediary. So they will die. They will cease to exist. So, just to end up over here, for, the, for this part of the chapter, we see that the entire tachlit, the entire purpose of Yemot HaMashiach and Tchiyat HaMetim is really the revelation of his Do you have any idea what Tchiyat HaMetim will be like? To me, as I've said before, Tchiyat HaMetim is even more important, or a greater miracle in a sense, than Mashiach himself in the Bet HaMikdash. It will be something incredible to see everybody who passed away come back. It's like a, a creation again of so the they world. Regardless if they were set there or it's just everybody. What is that? So just all any, those that deserve to get up. That deserve. Yeah, there are those who will get up, but they will not have a share to the world to come, which is a whole different idea. But a lot of people will rise to an angel. This is a very important principle in our faith. And that is really the perfection of the world, because think about it, death is part of the imperfection. And if you remember the story of Chayda Damarishon, human being needs to die. Well, that will no longer be the case. So the world reaches the point of its perfection, which is the taklit, which is the ultimate goal of what Hashem wanted. And when that happens, the Tumah will be completely removed from the land. So he says, this Takhlit, this ultimate goal of Hashem's revelation, really depends on us drawing the light of Hashem into the animal soul of Klalut Israel, of the, of the entire Jewish nation, in all its organs, in all the 248 organs, through the observance of the 248 positive commandments and through the caution, in other words, through our holding ourselves back from, God forbid, transgressing any of the 365 negative commandments. So 
the way we bring about the removal of the impure forces is by being careful with the 365 negative commandments. Whereas by observing the 248, we bring about the light of Hashem, the light of the Or and Sof, into the physical world, into the Nefesh Abbevit as well to the animal spirit. So in this way we strangulate the Tum'ah by keeping away from the 365 negative commandment, which is really something that is, I guess you can say, under their dominion under their influence and we hold ourselves back and control ourselves we are taking away power from them when a Jew God forbid, succumbs and does an, a sin he gives them power he empowers them they nourish from the Kiddushah we, we don't want them to have any more vitality from the Kiddushah so by making sure that we don't transgress the 365 negative commandments and on top of that, also observe the 248 positive commandments. We obviously uh, bring about a tremendous light into this world, the light of the Oren Sof, that diminishes their koach, automatically diminishes their power. And by doing so continuously, this will lead to the eventual taklit, in the end of days, when they will cease to exist completely. As he started off saying, this really depends on us. In other words, the ultimate taqlid that Hashem wants to bring all along, which is the perfection of this world, the elevating this world to a more spiritual state, where the light of Hashem will shine, not long, longer be concealed, and not have this competition, depends on our masim and our deeds. He doesn't want to do the work himself. He wants us to do it. And this happens, this actually happens by the Jewish people observing the 248 or being careful with the 365. The rest of the chapter will <clears throat> talk about how come, how, do, how is it possible, how does it work that drawing the light of the Orient Sof on our neshamot, the neshamot of the Jewish people, can generate a similar situation in the entire world which is what we began to explain, that it's not only something that we do for ourselves, we're doing something for the entire world. So that's going to be the next question. Was, that is what he's going to talk about next. How does this happen? That the light that we're drawing upon ourselves, that does something so special to us by elevating us, how is it that this same light can actually transform the entire world? Hashem, we'll see that next. It's, uh, it's an incredible idea that obviously people do not realize, but this world is really something that is left to the hands of man to make it what he wants it to be. It could be a paradise, a beautiful place, or it could be hell. Unfortunately, look at what has happened throughout history, and you can see that it hasn't been really a paradise. And uh, perhaps you can even say that that is why man was kicked out <laughs> of, the, of the real paradise. Shem says, don't ruin this for me. <laughs> you know, but the world will become a paradise. When obviously, when, when, when Hashem reveals himself and the evil forces are completely gone. In the meantime, look how much depends on the Jewish people. Because we are entrusted with the 248 plus 365 that is the key of drawing the light of Hashem into this world.